Brilliantly put. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me speak to, because I'm, I'm speaking to Yaron Brook soon. Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, I like him. Yeah. So, but that, another example, I was... Ask him to tell you a joke about Ayn Rand, if he can do it. So there, that's one criticism I've heard you say, which is they're unable to speak to any weaknesses in either Ayn Rand's or objectivist worldview. Yes. That's really, uh, you, you put it, I know you're half joking, but that's actually a legitimate discussion to have. I'm not, I'm not joking at all. Because that, that's, to me, one of the criticisms and one of the explanations why the world seems to uh, disrespect Ayn Rand, the, the people that do, is she kind of implies that her ideas are like flawless. No, she, she says they correspond to reality. Yeah, right. That's the term she uses. That, <laughs> I mean, objective is it's in the name. It's, you know, it's just facts. Like it's impossible to basically argue against because it's pretty simple. It's just all facts. And well, that's, that, it's possible to argue against, but she would say she's never met a good critic who right. can argue the facts about misrepresentation. And she's not entirely wrong. She's often caricatured because she has a very extreme personality and extreme view, worldview. But that to me, I mean, some people, there's a guy named in the physics mathematics community called Stephen Wolfram. I don't know if you're Wolfram Alpha? Yeah. Oh, okay. He has a similar style of speaking sometimes, which is like, I've created a science, but that turns a lot of people off, like this kind of weird, confidence, but he's one of my favorite people. I think one of the most brilliant people, if you just ignore that little bit of ego or whatever you call that, yeah, yeah. that there's some beautiful ideas in there. Oh, and yeah, she's th an amazing person. And that for me, objectivism, I'm undereducated about it. About it. Uh, I, I hope to be more educated, but there's some interesting ideas that, again, just like with UFOs, <laughs> uh, not that there's a connection between don't, don't two. Don't bring that up to your own, he won't like it. <laughs> Ayn Rand's like UFOs. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, this no. interview is over. <laughs> uh, that's a good yarn. Okay. Uh, but, you know, you have to be a little bit open-minded. But what's your sense of, of objectivism? What's uh, Are there interesting ideas that are useful to you to think about? That? I own her copy of the first printing of The Fountainhead. So that should tell you a little bit about how my affection for Miss Rand, how heavy that goes. Um, I Ayn Rand does not have all the answers, but she has all the questions. So if you study Rand, you are going to be forced to think through some very basic things and you're going to have your eyes open very, very heavily. Uh, she was not perfect. She never claimed to be perfect. She was asked on Donahue, uh, is it true that according to your philosophy, you are a perfect being? She said, I never think of myself that way. And she said, but if you ask me, do I practice what I preach? The answer is yes, resoundingly. Um, <laughs> she's a fascinating woman. Uh, what is really interesting about her, and this is something you'd appreciate personally, is when you read her essays, she'll have these weird asides. And it looked like she would talk about art and she'd be like, and this is why the US should be the only country with nuclear weapons. And when you follow a, a brilliant mind making these seemingly disparate connections, it's something I find to be just absolutely inspiring and, and awesome and entertaining. Um, I think there's lots of things about her that people like Yaron would make uncomfortable. Um, I, I, well, like she, they, so objectivism, like any other philosophy, has all these techniques to kind of hand wave away things you don't want to talk about and like pretend that, so they talk about things like having no meta, metaphysical significance, right? So what that means is like, well, what about this? Ah, I don't want to talk about it. Like, it doesn't matter. Like it literally means in fancy philosophical terms, it doesn't matter. Or they will say correctly that it's very twisted in our culture that when we have heroes, we look for their flaws instead of looking for their virtues. That's a 100% valid perspective. However, if I'm sitting here telling you that I think this woman is a badass and she's amazing and she should be studied, but there's also these idiosyncrasies, they don't want to hear it because they, and I think it's very convenient for them because there's a lot of things she did that were, here's an example. Rand was very, very pro- a happiness and pleasure. She was very pro-sex, which is kind of surprising looking at her and how she talked and how strident she was. Yeah. As a result of this, she never got her cats fixed to deny them the pleasure of orgasm. So her male cats are spraying up her entire house. Yeah. Like that is, I mean, that's her putting her philosophy into practice, but it's still gross. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing where I don't think he'd be, another thing is Rand had an, art, an article on a woman president and she said a woman should never be president, right? 
Now, when Rand says things that are too goofy for them, they say, oh, that's not objectivism. That's her personal preference. It's like uh, she did not have these lines. Objectivism was always defined as Ayn Rand's writings plus the additional essays in her books. So if this was in part of those books, this counts as official objectivism, but they pretend otherwise. So that's another example. Plus they, they she was, and I bet you she was on the spectrum to some extent. I'm not joking. I'm not using that derisively. She was of the belief and not inaccurately because that humor is used to denigrate and humiliate. And she was thinking about the John Stewart type before there was a John Stewart. And a lot of times, like well, how I use mocking, but she was resentful correctly that a lot of times people who are great and accomplished, little nobodies will make a punchline uh, just to bring them down and just bother her. I, here's an example I just thought of. I remember in, I don't remember when it was, it must've been the nineties. They had a segment of MTV of all these musicians who were making their own perfumes, right? And this girl grabbed Prince's perfume and before she even smelled it, she had the joke ready. She, she goes, oh, this smells almost as bad as his music lately. It's like, first of all, I'm sure the perfume's fine. Yeah. And second of all, this is Prince. He's one of the all-time greats and you can't wait to, yeah. you know, you know, denigrate him. Like how and part I want to be like Rand, like, how dare you? Like as if as if this perfume in any way, in any way mitigates his amazing accomplishments and achievements. Right. You horrible person. But I do have some great Ayn Rand jokes and he would not be happy about them. The perfume thing, the problem with it is just not funny. Not that- right. Oh, he sucks. Okay, great. It, not that it, they dared to try to be humorous. Right. Because I don't know why you mentioned John Stewart, because John Stewart is pretty, can be funny. Right, but he, his, can, he taught a generation, you still see this on Twitter, where things have to be inherently sarcastic uh, and snide. But isn't that, I mean, aren't you practicing that? Like, no, I well? use irony, not sarcasm. Here's an example. When people, like you say something and someone replied, to be like, um, last I checked, blah, 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 blah. And I'll say that, I, see, I yeah. go, what do you think saying last I checked added to your point? You're giving me valuable information and data, but you are trained to believe that it has to be couched in this sneering. It doesn't. Just give me the information. This is useful information. Yeah. The, uh, that's that's true. It's a knee jerk. But see, John Stewart did it masterfully. Correct, and they don't. And they they don't. It's it's like people who copy comedians, certain comedians. You try to copy them, and you lose everything in the yeah. process of copying. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, but in terms of the uh, the philosophy of you know selfishness, this kind of individual focused idea, and I'm, I'm, I imagine that connects with you. Yes, it's, it's, and I think it would connect with more people if they understood what she meant by it. Nathaniel Brandon, who was her heir until she kind of broke with him and, and he was the co-dedicatee of Atlas Shrugged, said, no one will say Ayn Rand's views with a straight face. They won't say, I believe that my happiness matters and is important and is worth fighting for and that Ayn Rand says this and she's dangerous. Now, it's very easy to say this could have dangerous consequences if you're a sociopath, but to put it in those terms, uh, I think is extremely healthy. I think more people should want to be happy, and and have. I think a lot of us are raised to be apologetic, especially in this, this cynical media culture. That if you say I want to be happy, I want to love my life, that it's just like okay, sweetheart, and you the, the eye rolling. And I think that's so pernicious and so horrifying. And this is why I'm a Camus person because Camus thought the arch enemy was cynicism, and I could not agree more. Like if you are the kind of person, if someone likes a band, and you're like, oh, you like them, blah blah blah. It's like this gives them happiness. Yeah. Now there's certain exceptions, but if it gives you happiness, it's not for you. That's cool. Okay, this is beautiful. I I, I so agree with you on the eye rolling, but you see the best of trolling as not the eye roll. Correct. Of course not. The best of trolling is taking down the eye rollers. I'm gonna have to think about that. Okay. Because I have I kind of Red Bull. Yeah. Because I put them My all. My blood this... type is Red Bull. <laughs> Um, I kind of put them all in the same bin. Okay. And they're not. They're not. They're not. Okay. 